I said I wouldn't be emotional today, and here I am crying like a little baby. It's so good to see you. It's not the same preaching to a camera, I promise. It's just not the same. But we're so thankful for the technology that God gave us to get through this season and continue to move through this season. And so it's an honor to say welcome to all those who are online that continue to stay connected to Radiant Church through our live simulcast. And welcome to those who are here. We got any Ankeny people in the house? Let me hear it. All right. Love it. Got any Colfax folks out there? Oh, team spirit for Colfax. Anybody from Pleasant Hill? <laughs> I love it. One church all together for a service for all those online. You can yell right there inside your living room. No problem for that. We're so glad that you're here, and uh, looking forward to diving into the Word today, you know, as we're thankful for the technology to continue to allow us to simulcast, and thankful for the season that we were able to go through. I keep hearing time and time again from most people, it was no substitute for being together. It wasn't the same thing. And I think sometimes we just have to learn those things in life. And I preached on that a week or two ago, just say, you know what, while there's been a lot of bad things during the season that have happened, I also think that we've been given a gift. That in this time of gift, we realize how important church is. We realize how important our families are. We realize how important many other things that we take for granted in life were during this season. And now we have the opportunity to reflect upon that and say, are we going to go back to the way things were? Or do we need to make some changes in our lives? And I know as a church, I never, ever want to take ever for granted, not that we ever did on purpose, but you know how it is. Sometimes you can just get in a routine and things become ho-hum and we forget of just how important they are. May we never do so again. We're going to kick off a new series today. We don't have a video device, as you see. If you're here in the live simulcast, you should have it at home. So I'm going to encourage you, if you have your Bibles today or your electronic device, to turn to Matthew chapter 7. Good uh, options if you don't have one on your electronic device, your phone or your iPad or, or whatever it may be, is uh, Bible Gateway is a great application, and version are both free Bible apps available on, online, and uh, I encourage you, take a moment, download it, use it during the week. There's great devotionals, great studies on there to help you through that, but uh, if you take a moment to do that, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7 and a couple other places as well, but I want to open with a story today that many of us are familiar with. If you've been at church for some period of time, uh, and even if you haven't been at church, this is a story that kind of transcends into our culture, and that's the story of two houses. One is built on sand, and one is built on the rock. I want to look at that today as we open the Beatitudes. And, and oddly, you might be thinking, wait a minute, if you know your Bible, Beatitudes are off in chapter 5. Well, hang with me for just a moment. We're, we're in Matthew 7, and this will make sense in a moment. But in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, it says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down. The streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as a teacher of the law. Notice when he opened this, what he said, he said, everyone who hears these words, what words is he referring to? Is he referring to all of his words? Well, the argument certainly could be made for that. But in this context, no, he's referring to a sermon he's giving, believe it or not. Jesus is giving a sermon. And this story is at the very end of a three-chapter sermon he's giving, we know as the Sermon on the Mount. It starts in chapter 5, and this thing continues all the way through chapter 7. If you've hung out with me long enough, you know that oftentimes I will have a so what moment at the end of a sermon. Kind of a, you know, in summary, here's where we're headed. Here's where the, 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 the rubber meets the road type of moment. If you're familiar with that, this is Jesus' so what moment at the end of a long sermon. When he gets to the very end, he tells this story. 
And he says, listen, these three chapters of words that you've been hearing, these words, put them into practice. If you do, you will build a strong foundation. And I think this is important as we're starting this series in the Beatitudes. In this three-chapter sermon that Jesus is giving, he starts with something called the Beatitudes. And we're going to spend the next eight weeks walking through those Beatitudes and learning what do they mean? How do we apply this to our life? Why are they so important? But today, before we dive into any of them, I just wanted to kind of take a step back and let's get some perspective. Why is Jesus giving this sermon? Why is this sermon important? I just want to lay the groundwork for what the next eight weeks following this are going to look like. And to do that, we need to do a little bit of homework. We need to ask ourselves, how did Jesus get to this point where he's telling this sermon? There's a large crowd that's gathered around him. His disciples are there. What led up to this? And it's important that we understand that. And so as we go backwards, just even a couple chapters We know, and many of you know the story of Jesus. He began his earthly ministry through baptism. He went out, he was baptized by John the Baptist. The Spirit of God rested on him, and and, and God said, This is my son, whom I am proud. From there, Jesus went out into the wilderness where he fasted for 40 days. And during that time, he was tempted, tempted with three things that many of us are tempted at in life as well. And by the way, when you make a decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ, when you dive into this thing called Christianity, I want to promise you, you're going to be tempted. The enemy's going to come after you. There's going to be a time where you're going to have some doubts. You're going to have to think things through. When you make a decision to follow the king and you leave the devil, the devil doesn't allow you to do so easily. So be ready for that. There's going to be temptation. There's going to be problems along the way. Jesus is out in the wilderness and he's tested on three specific things. The first thing he's tested on is, am I going to live by the flesh or am I going to live by the spirit? And Jesus makes the decision to continue to live by the Spirit. But many of us in our lives have that struggle, don't we? Am I going to live by the earthly pleasures, or am I going to keep my eyes focused on God? From there, he is tempted as he's taken to the temple with the lure of religion. Religion itself isn't bad, but organized religion can be. If you allow it to be out of control, if it becomes about rules and regulations... And at Jesus' time, the religious bodies and the religious leaders around him had a control on the people that it was never intended to be. Jesus would later say, instead of showing them God, you're keeping them out of heaven with your teaching. He was, he was very strict. He was, he was oftentimes even rude sometimes to the religious leaders of his day because he understood that religion, while it can be a good thing, can be used in bad ways as well. And from there, then Jesus was shown the empires of the world. And we see that we all can struggle with power, control, the lure to want to have more power, to use that power selfishly is something that we struggle with many people throughout the world. And each of those, Jesus would conquer, conquer it and would tell the devil eventually to go away and don't tempt him. But it's interesting in those three temptations, he would face them again at some point where he started his his ministry here on earth, at the apex of his ministry, he would face those same three temptations as we see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane sweating drops of blood, crying out to God saying, if you could take this cup from me, please, but ultimately submitting and surrendering to the leadership and saying, not my will, but your will be done. It's interesting that the very people who would accuse him and put him on trial was religion, the thing he faced. And ultimately, he would be nailed to a Roman cross, the empire of the day, exercising its might and its power. Those same things things that Jesus would face in the wilderness, he would ultimately face again at the climax of his ministry. From there, out of the wilderness, then Jesus goes and he begins to tell people who he is. We see that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. He looks to the crowd and he says, As quoting from Isaiah, he says, The people are living in darkness, and they have seen a great light. And those living in the land of the shadow of the death, a light has dawned. Jesus is telling light is invading the darkness. There is a new light. And he calls it, it's interesting there, he calls it the land of the shadow of death. 
Imagine from Jesus' perspective as he comes into the world. He comes from heaven where things are vivid, things are beautiful. There's no worry, there's no shame, there's no guilt. There is life eternal. All is good in heaven. And he comes down to this group of people who seem scared all the time, who seem like they're constantly living in fear, who are afraid of dying, who are constantly chasing money, who are constantly worried about the next thing. He comes into what he calls this land of darkness to shine the light. And what was true 2,000 years ago, I'm afraid we've noticed recently, is just as true today. How much of our culture is so afraid of so many things, rather than connecting to God and, and saying, your will be done, as Jesus would ultimately say. That light is invading our lives. That life invades death. Hope is dawning. Jesus is casting vision like any good leader would do. It's from there in Matthew 4, 17 that we see that from that time Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus is saying, listen, you're not made to live this way. You don't have to live like this. There is another kingdom. There is another way. There is another realm. You can live differently. I'm shining my light to show you there is this thing called the kingdom. Be aware of it. It's real. And you have seen it. You can't say you haven't seen it because he's telling them it has come near. I'm here. Hear me talk. The kingdom is right in front of you. See me. You see the kingdom. So he's telling them to repent, which means change directions, change your mind, go a different way. You don't have to live that way anymore. And what's important is every one of Jesus' teachings are always connected to kingdom. You have to keep that in the mind. We've talked a lot about that in the last year. But Jesus was always pointing towards kingdom, and that's going to be important in our understanding of the Beatitudes. The next thing Jesus does is he goes and he gets disciples, followers. We see that in Matthew 4, 19. As he looks to a group of fishermen, he says, Come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. And what's interesting is it said at once they left their nets and they followed him. We could preach an entire sermon just on those two verses right there alone. Jesus saying, come follow me. The very first thing is that great invitation he always gives. He says, come follow me. Come be like me. Come learn from me. Become like me. That's what follow me means. Jesus wasn't inviting them into religion again. Jesus wasn't inviting them into a catechism. He wasn't inviting them into classes or confirmation. He wasn't inviting them into mass. Jesus was inviting them into a new way of life. Come follow me, learn from me, model me, become like me. Are you ready to follow Jesus wherever you go? And then he tells them in those verses, I will send you out. And we learn that as we go to follow Jesus Christ, we're going to be sent out. It's not an invitation to comfort. It's not an invitation to settle in. It is an invitation to be sent, that we are the sent people of God. For those who follow me, I will send them out. And sometimes I'm going to send you out to dangerous places. Sometimes I'm going to send you out to places you don't want to go. Are you willing to go? Are you willing to follow me there? That's the question he's asking them, and that's the question to ask you. And the bigger question is this. When you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, become a believer, is that what you signed up for? It's an important question. Did you sign up to be sent wherever he wants to send you? And then we ask the question, then what are we sent to do? And, of course, he's talking to a group of fishermen, so he uses an analogy, but he says, I'm sending you out to fish for people. But we understand what that means because in Matthew 28 later, he would tell them, go make disciples. We are being sent to go make disciples wherever we go. And this is, again, why we keep asking the question in the last two years. It's so important. Who's your one? Who's that person you're discipling? Who's that person you're pouring into? Who's your one? Because we have been sent to make more disciples, to fish for people. And then the last one, of course, is that interesting second verse. They left everything to follow Jesus. Did you catch that? They left everything to follow Jesus. They laid it all down. They gave it up. 
and they followed him. Which leads to the question all of us have to ask. Have you given it all to Jesus? Or are you still trying to negotiate the terms of your surrender? Have you truly given it all to him? Those are the sort of people Jesus was calling to be the leaders in his church as he was gathering them up. And so as you look at that and, and you say, I, I, have I left it all behind? Who's my one have I fully surrendered? Am I passionate about making disciples? Is that how you would describe your Christianity? Because that's what Jesus was calling us to. And why I keep bringing this up and why we're building and paving the ground before we get to the Beatitudes is we have to understand this. If we don't fully understand the sort of people Jesus was inviting and even the terms for which he was inviting them, we will not understand the Beatitudes. They won't make sense fully, or they will become something we didn't intend them to become. And so Jesus is, make sure we get this right. Do you understand what this great invitation is that I'm inviting us into? As we get to the end of chapter 4, we see that Jesus is going and he's preaching the, the kingdom wherever he goes. He's got his disciples with him now, and he's healing people along the way. And now he's beginning to show them the power of this new life. He's showing them the power of this kingdom that can be in their lives. And as he does that, he's gathering crowds around him. He's saying, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. And he's healing them. And now he's got disciples. People are kind of wondering, what's going on? Who is this man? What is he teaching? What is this kingdom thing? What does this all mean? He's building crowds. There's an excitement that's building more and more as he goes out. And that is where we open up chapter 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount. That is when we get to the kingdom. And what we see in chapter 5 is he begins to open with these things called blessed statements. Blessed are the, pure, the poor. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. We see that he begins to teach blessed are along the way. And now it makes sense, too, when we get to Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, if you want to turn your Bibles to that. It says, now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountainside and sat down. And his disciples came to him, and he began to teach to them. Now it makes sense where we're at in the story. Jesus has been preaching the kingdom. He's been building excitement. People are curious. People are wondering, what is this thing? He's been healing them along the way. So they're, so they're, they're going, hey, what, what, is, what, what is this thing? Who is this man? There's an excitement. And now comes the time for him to sit down and tell them, here is this kingdom. Here's what it looks like. Here's what it's all about. That's where we're at when we get to Matthew chapter 5. And Jesus begins to preach what I believe is the greatest sermon of all time. It is certainly the longest sermon in the Bible. It is not the longest dialogue Jesus has in the Bible, however. That belongs to John chapter 13 through 18, which is the entire night that Jesus was with his disciples before he was arrested. But this is Jesus' longest sermon in there. And now Jesus is going to answer the question, what is his kingdom telling us? So he opens with these blessed statements. Blessed are the pure. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are peacemakers. Just one after the other. But it's here we also have to hit the pause button now as we move into the teaching on the Beatitudes. What do we mean by blessed? In fact, some of you might have a translation, different translation. Some say happy are instead of blessed in this. The NLT incorrectly says God blesses those in it. What is this word? And, and what you need to know is the Greek word that's used here that we're using for blessed is very difficult word. There is no exact correlation in English to this word. And we've run across this a few times in the Bible. Sometimes the Greek, ancient Greek, doesn't translate well to the English. This is one of those times. They've struggled to find a good word here. Blessed is one of those that they've come close to. Most scholars, however, would say a literal word in English that gets closer than blessed is flourishing. Flourishing. In other words, you're, you, you've got this life that is flourishing. The problem and the reason they don't use that is it doesn't work well in the English language in these sentences. When you start saying flourishing are the meek, it doesn't make sense suddenly. Flourishing are the poor in spirit. 
And so they've kind of settled in on blessed are. But understand that they have a hard time finding the exact word here. And we have to be careful when we use blessed are, is it can send a conflicting message. That's why I hit the pause button on this. Because sometimes, and I've heard it taught this way, and we have to be careful about it, it's taught in a transactional way. In other words, blessed means if you do this, God will do this. And if we have that understanding, we'll miss what Jesus was teaching in the Beatitudes. It's not transactional. It's not an instruction manual. It's not a rule book. He's not saying do this and God will be off your back. And a lot of times we read it that way. And I need us to take a step back and consider that that's not, in fact, what Jesus is doing here. And to try to look at this through a different lens right now. Again, He's not teaching an instruction manual here on how to be blessed in your life. And I want to give a quick example to that because you might be thinking, I don't know, Jason. That's the first I've heard that. That's fine. Let's go ahead and go into week one, which will be next week. And here's something to consider. Next week it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Do you honestly believe Jesus is looking at a group of people and saying, I want you to be poor in spirit? The right way to live if you want to be blessed, is to be poor in spirit. When consistently we read in the New Testament, we are to be full of the Spirit. We are to be filled with the Spirit, that our bodies are a temple for the Spirit of God. And so it's not prescriptive in this case. He's not saying you should be poor in spirit if you wish to be blessed by God. That's why I want to challenge you. Be careful about reading it that way. That's not what's going on in here. We'll talk more about being poor in the Spirit next week. And we've got to ask the right questions before we get into the Beatitudes as well. The question isn't when Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. The question isn't how do I get in? The question when it concerns the Beatitudes is who is this kingdom for? Who's this kingdom for? Because what we're going to learn is the Beatitudes are an an invitation to a group of people to a life that Jesus is calling them into. The Beatitudes are an amazing invitation. Take a step back and let me give you a crass version to kind of understand this. Imagine you're an entrepreneur and you've got this amazing product that you think is going to revolutionize the world. And you go out and you don't tell everything about it at first. At first you just say, I've got this product, you need it, you're going to want it, it's awesome, you're going to love this thing. And, and, and you know what, I'm going to sell this product so I get a management team around me, I start to develop the people around me, and then I might go out and even show pieces of this product to various people. What are you doing? You're drumming up interest, you're trying to get people excited, you're building momentum for your product. That's what's going here. But at some point, While you're building that momentum, as you're gathering people around, as you're building excitement on this thing, you actually have to tell them what it is. At some point, you've got to stop and say, okay, I got your attention. Now let me tell you and invite you as to why I think you want this thing. That's a little bit of what's been going on. That's why we took a step back and asked the question, how did we get to this point? Jesus is building excitement. He's getting people interested. He's got their attention, and now it's time for him to make his pitch. It's time for him to say, here's why this is important. Here's why I think you need this thing. And so we have to be careful. We have to be careful about seeing it like a bunch of rules and regulations or or an instruction manual. This is an incredible invitation from Jesus to be a part of this kingdom thing he's been talking about all along. It's about the way... He created you to live, understanding there is another realm, there is another reality, another way to live. And so for today, I want you to hear these Beatitudes in modern language. And I wonder if this doesn't make a little more sense for us as we begin this journey into the Beatitudes. Jesus is looking at this group of people who are fearful who are in the land of darkness, scared. He looks at them and he says, are you running on empty? Have you tried to find love and happiness in many different ways only to find emptiness in all of that? If so, this kingdom is for you. 
Do you grieve over your own sinfulness and the sinfulness of the world? Does it pain you to see how sin destroys your life? Not just your life, but the people around you. Jesus says, come to this kingdom and you will be comforted. Are you tired of the proud and the powerful preying on the weak? And Jesus says, this kingdom's looking for people like you. Do you look at the brokenness, the hurt, and the pain of the world and wish for it to be made right? Anybody watching the news this week? Anybody seeing what's going on? Do you ever just hunger to see the world made right? To live in the way that God designed it and created it to be? And Jesus is looking at us and saying, join us. This time is coming when God is going to put things back together again. He will make things right. He looks and says, do you long to see the poor and the marginalized treated with fairness, dignity, and respect? Boy, have we faced that one this week, huh? Do you long to see the poor and the marginalized, all people treated with dignity and respect? Jesus looks at him and says, mercy and grace are at the center of this thing called kingdom. Come. Come. Do you long to see and experience God? And Jesus says, you can. He's in this kingdom. Do you yearn for peace? And Jesus says, God is peace. His kingdom is peace. Come join the family. And are you tired of being mocked, persecuted, bullied when you stand up for what is right, when you do the right things? And Jesus looks at him and says, if you do, this kingdom is for you. It's an invitation to a group of people to tell them what this kingdom looks like and invite them to be a part of it. When he gets to blessed are the poor, he's not saying live that way. He's saying, I'm inviting you. If you're on empty, if you're tired, if it just seems like you're beating the, your head on the wall, come. This kingdom is for you. It's an invitation, and the Beatitudes are an invitation to a new way of life and what it looks like to live it out on earth, a life that I now invite you to, a life that we're going to journey through for the next eight weeks. And it's going to make us ask one important question. What is the life we are called to live? Is it the life you're living now? or the one Jesus is inviting you into. Wrestle with that. Read the Beatitudes this week. Only look at them now through a different set of lenses. It's not a rule book. It's an invitation. Jesus is calling you to be a part of this thing called kingdom so that we can flourish with him. Let's pray.